James need to take responsibility for his behavior. We don't have a miracle for you, no medically, no surgically. You need to change, and she need to stop bringing you food. The skill's malfunctioning. They won't give me away. Is it malfunctioning, or are you still over the weight limit of the skin? You just telling me the truth. I just drove five hours. I do love my daughter, but I will not tolerate the way she's been living. Shakia Jackson, a 26-year-old from North Carolina, was one of the youngest patients to seek help from Dr. Now. Weighing in at a staggering 655 pounds, she was already suffering from asthma and lymphedema, making every step a Herculean task. Imagine needing a walker in your 20s. It's like life's playing a cruel joke, but the punchline is that it hurts like hell. Hello everyone! Before we dive into the most inspiring transformation stories on my 600 LB life, make sure to hit that subscribe button and ring the bell so you never miss out on these jaw-dropping stories. Ready for the wild ride? Let's get into it. I wake up in the morning with swelling because of the lymphedema that's in my leg. When I first did, I'd be like, whoosh, because of the pain in my leg, in my knees. So much pain because it's so much weight. By the time I get to the bathroom, it's like my breathing is like bad. I already have asthma too, so. Her eating habits were nothing short of a horror show. Picture this breakfast consisted of stacks of pancakes drenched in syrup, bacon and eggs a feast fit for a king, except it was just for her. And lunch? Fast food galore. Dinner? Well, let's just say it was a buffet of fried chicken, mashed potatoes, and desserts that could make a sweet tooth weep. Her family tried to intervene, but their attempts were as effective as a screen door on a submarine. They loved her, sure, but enabling seemed easier than confronting the issue. My family did try to tell me, cut down on food, choose better, healthy options. But I don't choose those options because the role of food in my life is a top priority. I've been like that ever since growing up. Her past was riddled with trauma, including suffering from sexual assault and living in foster care. Food became her solace, her shield against the world's cruelties. It's almost like she was building her own protective fortress with every bite. But instead of bricks and mortar, her fortress was constructed from burgers, fries, and sugary treats. Oh, the irony of seeking protection from something that's slowly killing you, right? My mom raised me until I was in the second grade. Then we were placed into foster care. When we was in second grade, my mom started leaving us on our own while she was working three jobs. So then one of the neighbors made a report to child services. And we were too young to know what was going on. When they took me away from my mom, I was in foster care for two to three weeks until my dad took full custody. Fortunately, Shakia began to have a good support system as she decided to take a drastic step by visiting Dr. Now. Their first meeting was, to put it mildly, a showdown. Dr. Now, with his no-nonsense attitude, didn't sugarcoat anything because, let's face it, Shakia had enough sugar in her diet already. He laid it all out her current weight, the health risks, and the brutal truth that if she didn't change, she wouldn't live to see another decade. His advice? A strict 1,200 calorie diet and a regimen of moderate exercise. Easier said than done for someone who considered lifting a fork as cardio. This is the highest weight. So, what do you think got you to this point? Um, I became an emotional eater. What do you mean you've been an emotional eater? I had some dramatic things happen. So, at what day did you notice that you were overweight? I really started noticing like my weight really picking up when I was like in college. But it wasn't until recently it got worse to where I'm not able to do like the things I used to do. So how was your activity? I see you got a lot of uh, lymphedema in your left leg. Shakia's progress was a roller coaster of emotions. Initially, she was tasked with losing 50 pounds to qualify for bariatric surgery. However, her first weigh-in after starting the program was a crushing disappointment she had lost only a few pounds. The disappointment was palpable, and the excuses flowed like the soda she used to drink. But Dr. Now, ever the tough taskmaster, wasn't having any of it. He demanded accountability, and quite frankly, showed her the mirror she had been avoiding. Because your view probably has helped to survive with a BMI like that. You're only 26, if you keep this up, you may not make it to 30. And at this point, we give you the roadmap and start working on this. Okay. So how much weight does she need to lose? 
around 500 pounds for her height. But if you're talking about her first goal, she needs to lose 50 pounds over the next two months to show me that she's serious if she wants to have weight loss surgery. However, Shakia's journey took a harrowing turn when she suffered from respiratory failure. She recalled going to bed one night and waking up on a ventilator. The ordeal left her using a walker, adding another layer of difficulty to her already challenging path. Despite this, she only managed to drop 20 pounds over a year. Her failure to lose the required weight led doctor now to drop her from the program. He told her that he might consider taking her as a patient again if she got herself back on track. You lost eight pounds instead of 50. And that's not a lot of progress. That's as much as I lost in the past year. That's an improvement. Something is always going to be improvement over nothing. So that's not saying much. The reality is that it's been over a year now and you only lost 20 pounds. So you haven't changed your diet much at all. I cut back and I cut back even more on these past few months. So I'm trying, doctor, now. If you give me another chance, I can keep going and lose even more. James's life was a mess from the start. Tipping the scales at an astronomical 840 pounds, James was about as mobile as a couch. Seriously, he couldn't bathe or even go to the bathroom without help. Talk about living the dream, right? His girlfriend Lisa and his daughter Bailey were his lifelines, managing his care around the clock. Friends had to step in for tasks that were too much for Lisa alone, like bathing him. Now that's friendship taken to a new, disturbing level. James cannot take care of himself at all. He cannot bathe himself. He cannot use the restroom. He has to wear a catheter. And it breaks my heart to see that James is trapped in a bed and can't do the things that he loves to do. OK. Don't let me do it hard. I'm not. I got gotcha. you. Uh, Mom, that's good. Born into a chaotic household, his parents split due to his mother's alcohol issues, leaving him in the care of his dad. When his father remarried, James found himself one of five children in a financially strained household. This financial pressure led to poverty, and the fear of not having enough food made James eat as much as he could whenever it was available. I mean, you can't blame a kid for wanting to avoid starvation, but James took it to a whole new level. But my dad didn't make enough to provide for a family that big. And we went from having what we needed to being really poor. And I never knew if we were going to have enough to eat. So I just started to eat as much as I could when I got the chance. And I remember the joy and safety there was in food. So I started gaining some. And I was around 250 when I started high school. James's manipulation tactics made his situation even more complex. He was a master manipulator, often using guilt and emotional appeals to get what he wanted, even at the expense of his health and his loved one's well-being. Imagine having your daughter drop out of school to support you only to see that sacrifice exploited. Dark, right? This guy had a knack for making everyone around him feel like they owed him something. I always feel guilty because we just keep giving it to him. It looks good, baby. When I tell him he doesn't need it, he'll get mad and he'll yell. It makes me angry and sad at the same time. I'm so frustrated. Put the, that gravy on my plate with a new biscuit. One for now or? No, two. Two. Oh, gravy all over the top. <laughs> Enter Dr. Now, the bariatric surgeon known for his tough love approach. Their first meeting was nothing short of dramatic. Dr. Now took one look at James and knew he was a ticking time bomb. He warned James that his body was on the verge of giving out. James seemed to think he was signing up for some miracle cure, not realizing he was in for a rude awakening. Dr. Now's advice was blunt lose weight through diet and exercise before he could be considered for surgery. Imagine being told to drop a few hundred pounds as if it's just a matter of skipping dessert. How y'all doing? Uh, James, I'm back in a second. Uh, I want you to calm down right now because we're taking care of you, okay? Uh, and how are you doing? Terrible pain. I can't hardly really move. I'm hurting so bad. Okay. Uh, let's move to that bed over there. Oh. Relax, relax. Oh. Hold the stretcher still. One, two, three. Mm. Have a uh, you don't let his leg fall. James, how are you feeling now? Hurting. Okay, let me take a look at you. James's progress, or lack thereof, was a spectacle. On his second visit, it was clear he hadn't made the necessary changes. Excuses flowed like soda from a fountain, and the manipulative behavior continued. Dr. Now, with his no-nonsense approach, reiterated the importance of sticking to the diet plan and exercising. 
Yet, James's stubbornness was a formidable opponent. By the third visit, there was still minimal progress. You could almost hear Doctor now thinking, what part of diet and exercise don't you understand? You can tell that he is in pretty bad state. His cellulite is, is out of control, and he doesn't look to have lost any weight in the past four months. So how is your eating habit coming since I talked to you last time? Much better. James needs to take responsibility for his behavior. All right, we get you situated. We're gonna get some blood tests on you, okay? Okay. All right. But majority of this all falls on his girlfriend who has been enabling him. During his hospital stay under Dr. Now's watchful eye, the plot thickened. James's mother, Lisa, was caught sneaking food into the hospital. Yes, you heard that right. Like a twisted version of a heist movie, except instead of stealing jewels, she was smuggling snacks. Dr. Now's frustration hit an all-time high. He denied James the weight loss surgery, citing his refusal to adhere to the necessary lifestyle changes as the primary reason. Talk about tough love. You are the one that you got him in this bed, and you're the one making his life miserable right now. I've been trying to get him out of that bed. No, you are not. But if you did last time I talked to you, you changed his diet. It doesn't look like he lost any weight. Is this the lifestyle of a human being? This is a miserable no. lifestyle. And, and you got him into this shape, and you blaming everybody and him. I'm not blaming everybody. I'm not blaming him. Look, and, and if you all don't change the diet right now, he's going to go back to Kentucky. I'm not going to take care of him. I have brought him the food, but I didn't get him in that shape. You he, got him in this shape. He broke his ankle and got in the bed, and the bed broke, and so the flood started retaining him. James's story took an even darker turn when, despite all the interventions and efforts, he continued to struggle with binge eating. His refusal to alter his lifestyle led to a tragic end. On April 3, 2020, James passed away, leaving behind a cautionary tale of the devastating effects of obesity and the importance of taking personal responsibility for one's health. His story is a stark reminder of the severe consequences of failing to change harmful behaviors. And he has not wanted even to try. Until he stops with the excuses and lies, no other stage of the program will help him. Therapy won't, and he wouldn't survive an emergency weight loss surgery like slave gastrectomy. So there's absolutely nothing I can do to help him. But hopefully, he'll work to get under 600 pounds. If he does, I'll continue him on this program. But until then, James is done. Enjoying the episode so far? Give it a thumbs up and leave your thoughts in the comments below. Hang in there because Dolly Martinez's journey is about to get even more unsettling. At 25, Dolly realized she had to make a drastic change. With health hanging by a thread hello, congestive heart failure, and oxygen tanks, she reached out to Dr. Now, the bariatric surgeon who takes no prisoners. Just imagine needing assistance to breathe. Dolly's life was in serious jeopardy from the start. Shy, shy. I live with my mother, but my best friend, Cheyenne, helps me when she's here sometimes. Good morning. Cheyenne is a big girl like me too, so she understands where I'm coming from. Dolly's daily life? A blur of TV marathons, constant snacking and napping. Eight hours in front of the screen, grazing like a cow in a field, and the occasional siesta. What a life, right? Her diet was a sugar orgy. Picture her at the grocery store, her car gravitating to the candy aisle, piling up sweets like there's no tomorrow, brownies, ice cream, you name it. Dolly compared sugar to cocaine and heroin, wow. Talk about a sweet addiction. My mom would find the wrappers and get mad at me, but there's nothing she could do, really. The kindergarten. I was diagnosed with attention deficit disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, and bipolar disorder. I know that I am a little special ed because I have mental issues, but teachers made me feel like I was more special ed than I am. Here's the kicker. Her husband liked her bigger. Yep, you heard that right. He married her because of her size. As Dolly began shedding pounds, he morphed into the least supportive husband ever, practically sabotaging her efforts. A spouse who prefers you unhealthy. That's love, twisted style. I had just turned 21 and I was 400 pounds, but I didn't have much income and I didn't have no place to live. And that's when I met Ricky, the man that I married. On a social media chat thread, it turned out we had something in common. Because Ricky didn't have anywhere to go either. Ricky lived close to me, so we met in person. And not long after that, he invited me to come stay with him. Things took an even darker turn when their daughter was born. 
just six days old, and she was whisked away by Child Protective Services because Dolly and her husband couldn't provide a safe home. Her mother, Stacy, had to step in and take care of her. Can you believe the drama? It's like a soap opera on steroids. She's a beautiful child, beautiful spirit. She's just full of life and full of energy. I certainly didn't know three years ago I was going to be a mama, basically, again. I was given this child by CPS when she was six days old. A year later, we went to court, and she and her husband at the time both proved to the judge very incompetent. At her first weigh in with Dr. Now, Dolly tipped the scales at 593 pounds. Trying to patch things up with her mom, she ended up back with her unhelpful husband. Things spiraled out of control, landing her in a homeless shelter. There she met Philip, and within six weeks they were engaged, still homeless, speedy engagement much. What you do, 20, you just do the one. All right, you don't have to do, seed yourself every single time. Just work up to what you can do. All right. yeah. I think I might go sit on the couch for them. Okay. Dolly's progress was slower than a snail on a treadmill. By her second visit, the numbers barely moved. Dr. Now's patience was wore thin, and understandably so. Her chaotic life was a wrecking ball to her progress. At her third visit, the situation hadn't improved, leaving Dr. Now with no choice but to hit pause on surgery plans. Well, me and Philip finally found a house to move into. It took a lot longer to find an option we could afford than I thought it would. But we finally found one, which means I can go back and see Dr. Now. With her chaotic life and minimal weight loss, Dr. Now couldn't approve her for the life-changing surgery. By the episode's end, Dolly had only lost 40 pounds in a year. That's like running a marathon only to reach the first mile marker. Dolly's updates show her continuing to fight, proving that hope is a stubborn thing. I was told that I'm too controlling. I've encouraged her since she moved in with me to not overeat and to not eat what she shouldn't and to focus on herself emotionally, physically, all aspects of herself. And she promised that she would do so. That's what I should have done. And she did not. She has moved in and out of my home, in and out on her three and a half year old daughter. Ryan Barkdahl's journey on the show is a stark reminder that sometimes, despite the best intentions, reality takes a detour down Disaster Avenue. The man started his journey tipping the scales at a jaw dropping 740 pounds. Yep, you heard that right. This wasn't a quick trip to the recliner Ryan had practically taken up permanent residence in his. Every single task was a Herculean effort. I could keep eating and eating and eating. By the time that I finish the meal that I'm eating, I'm already thinking about the next meal. Like when I'm eating breakfast, I ask my mom what we're having for lunch. But I need to know what's in line and what's next because I already can't wait to eat again, even though I just did. So my whole day basically revolves around me eating and drinking and how I'm going to get more of it. And that's what drives me. And that's what consumes my thoughts. His upbringing wasn't exactly a nurturing Norman Rockwell painting, more like a chaotic circus without a ringmaster. Mom and stepdad were hardly vying for Parent of the Year awards, which left Ryan to fend for himself. The result? A deep, enduring love affair with food. By the ripe old age of 17, Ryan was clocking in at over 300 pounds and juggling a hefty drug addiction. Seriously, talk about carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. Freshman and sophomore year, I partied pretty hard. I smoked a lot. I drank more than any parent knows I did. I was still eating all the time also. And I just got worse and spiraled more out of control. And by the time I was 17, I was already up to 300 pounds. But that was a bad year for me because that was my junior year. And I got caught with a gram of marijuana at school. And that led to me getting kicked off the football team. Fast forward and hope came knocking in the form of Dr. Now. Ryan was ready or so, he said, to overhaul his life. But you know what they say about best laid plans, right? Despite Dr. Now's tireless efforts to whip him into shape, Ryan's commitment was about as solid as a sandcastle at high tide. But a few months in, and the needle on the scale barely budged. Hovering over 700 pounds, Ryan's adherence to the diet was more myth than reality. 
But now, after five years, you have no friends, and it snows a lot, and you will read because of that. I wouldn't say it like that. However you say it, that's what you're telling me. So it's concerning if you think those are actual excuses. My life's a lot harder than you'd understand. I heard that a lot of times, but that's not the issue. The issue is whether you're going to keep making excuses and blaming everything else for your situation, or if you're ready to wake up and get your life together. But wait, it gets better. Dr. Now, ever the optimist, set a new goal get below 650 pounds. Predictably, Ryan's weight stubbornly refused to cooperate thanks in no small part to his penchant for cheat days. And when confronted, his excuse, the scale is malfunctioning, oh, come on, that's right up there with the dog ate my homework. The scale's malfunctioning, they won't give me a weight. Is it malfunctioning or are you still over the weight limit of the scale? I know I made it to your goal, doctor, now. I worked hard, so I'm at least under 650 pounds right now. So you believe you're under 650 pounds? That's correct. All right. We will agree to disagree then because you don't look like you lost much weight since our last call. So I think the issue is that you're still over the 660 pound limit. In the end, even Dr. Now's saint-like patients were thin. With a heavy heart but firm resolve, Ryan was booted from the program. His story is a masterclass in what happens when ignorance meets indulgence. Ryan's journey, littered with missed opportunities and empty promises, is a stark illustration of how tough it is to align our actions with our intentions. Thanks for watching. If you found these stories as mind-boggling as we did, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe for more jaw-dropping stories. Don't forget to ring the bell so you never miss an update. Before my mom intervened, where I had my cheat days, because that got me through the first month of doing this, and not being able to have that, made the last couple months way too hard. So I'm letting myself go back to my way and enjoy one day a week of whatever I want. I just want to enjoy something that tastes good and makes me feel good. And that'll get me through the rest of the week to keep doing a diet and stay on track like I need to get to my next goal. Honey, come see this.